sat with Sarah Thornton in the office in her apartment in San Francisco while we talked about hierarchies within the art world, our superpowers, the truth about being polite, ceramics, and more than 30 reasons why art matters, among the sirens in the city and her attention-seeking cat. there in the UK, BBC radio, while they're working, um, you know, because they're working visually or with their hands and moving around. And it's unfortunate for me as a writer that I can't listen to podcasts while I write. Although, no. can I tell you my favorite podcast of late? Please. Dolly Parton's America. I have Have not listened to that, but I did a blog post for Sense and Jet's blog and they asked for the seven podcasts that I listened to. So that was pretty fun to go back through. But I didn't know about the Dolly Parton one because maybe I would have added that. What do you like about it? Well, I've never been a particular fan. I've never had anything against her either, but I, you know, and her hits, you know, come across my radar, but I've never owned a record. I've never watched a movie specifically about her. I don't even think I've seen Nine to Five. <laughs> With, is which possible? is kind of crazy. I don't know. <laughs> I think I missed it somehow. But it's on my list because I'm a longtime Lily Tomlin fan. And, you know, Jane. It's one of the best she, movies You know, ever. Jane Fonda, uh, you know, she's not always a great actress, but, you know, her heart's in the right place. So, you know, I'm with her. And, um, yeah, so I a friend of mine uh, recommended... Dolly Parton's America, and I, I'm on the sixth or the seventh episode of Nine, and it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, she's really a very intelligent woman who is a feminist in her own way, for although sure. she doesn't use that term. Right. Uh, she's certainly um, very liberal in her embracement of many communities, and um, she's clearly an amazing songwriter. I mean, some of her hits are no, you know, I hadn't realized she'd uh, written uh, that Whitney Houston uh, song. It's actually Dolly's song, and she sang it first, but then Whitney Houston made it really famous, and many people have sang it. And it's the, I think it's the best-selling song of all time. And, um, you know, it's from The Bodyguard. And I dare not sing it because I'm to I'm I can't sing at all. I have but to. But you sing know it. that song. Can you sing it? <laughs> I'm not going to sing that song either. Mostly because after you said Dolly Parton and Nine to Five, I have that song in my head. Okay. Yes, I can hear that song in my head much more easily, and I think it's an easier song to sing. I think it is, and I think yeah. it for me somehow sticks in my head as a working woman, um, and this yes. idea of working nine to five just to make a living, yeah, right? Uh, so last night, actually, I was at a girl's empowerment workshop. A friend of mine started a foundation called uh, G Project Glimmer, and we were at the Birdie's office with the CEO and founder of the company, and she was talking about how she was always motivated to make money and how women feel like they can't say that that's their primary motivation. And so she said it so many times to these high school girls, a lot of whom were from the Mission District, and they have these great partners that they collaborate with um, in terms of uh, social service organizations that, that help them target great, appropriate girls to um, be beneficiaries of, of their outreach. Mm -hmm. And then also great corporate partners who are excited about empowering girls. So making money is something that is so gendered and you see it, I, I see it particularly in relationship to artists. Um, if there are so many differences between the way male artists and female artists play their game and to make one big sweeping generalization, and of course there are loads of exceptions, the men are much more concerned about making money than the women. And the women often sometimes feel like they have weird 
mm, I don't know if weird is the right word, but have um, credibility concerns or concerned about their credibility if they become too motivated in that direction in a way that doesn't seem to disturb most of the men. So yesterday someone shared with me the statistic that of all the artists in the world who have gallery representation, only 12% are women, and asked if I was surprised by that figure. And I said, if I'm surprised at all, it's only that it's that high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then they have gallery representation, but like wh who, if you look at the hierarchy within the gallery about who commands what sums. Correct. You'll have a, you'll have a, a situation where, you know, accepting Yoyoi Kasama and Beatriz Mejayas right. <laughs> and, and a few others, right. the, the, the top dog in the gallery is going to be a male artist. Yeah. The top dog from a financial point of view. Right. So I first learned of you in your book, Seven Days in the Art World, and it was really... I don't know, both an insider's and an outsider's perspective on the art world, at least from my perspective. And it was really generous, I think, in that it was opening up some of the things that are very quiet about how the art world works. And I'm curious how, how you came to write that book. Well, you know, let's see. I studied art history as an undergraduate. Then I did communication studies. And then I, my PhD was sociology of culture. So I was moving through a variety of disciplines. And in the course of moving through those disciplines, I already, I also kind of slid down the cultural hierarchy because I did my PhD on dance clubs and raves. And, but it was about cultural values and judgments because it was kind of about hipness and coolness within rave culture. Mm -hmm. So I then went off and I was an academic and, um, did some other things, like I worked at an advertising agency for a little while. And um, and then uh, my friend Kitty Scott, actually, who's a curator of contemporary art, currently the chief curator of contemporary art at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. And we studied art history together. Mm -hmm. um, and she came to live with us again. I've, she, we've been roommates three times at three different, I think, so she was working at the Serpentine I think that's when this was. And I was like, you know, I've lost touch with contemporary art. And she kind of um, reignited my interest. Or just, you know, having her in the house. I was like, you know, I'd lost track of what had been going on. So um, I kind of came back to the art world. And I'd never been really, in, I'd never really inveigled my way in. <laughs> you know, I'd studied art history and I'd worked at an art gallery in Montreal. Um, and like the closest I came to kind of like the exciting hub of, uh, of the art world was, um, writing letters to George Siegel on his chicken ranch or, you know, I can't remember where he lived at the time. He lived in New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey. That he was did, actually he one have, of, uh, he, he did. lived on a farm. He did. He did. Actually, that was one of my first significant, uh, art exhibition experiences. I was working at the Jewish Museum. So I might tell cool. you my George Siegel story after you tell That's yours. A, well, I don't really have a substantial <laughs> George Siegel story. It was just that, you know, I was involved in some correspondence with him, which was kind of tickling to me at the time. And um, it was, you know, a kind of provincial outpost gallery, which showed New York pop art, you know. Uh, and uh, so you luckily there were some great artists that um, – had shows there, but I don't remember them like bothering to show up or anything like that. I, you know, well, anyhow. So, um, yes. So then, okay, quickly, I want to get. We want to come. You're going to tell us the story about George Siegel, but um, but I also I went, came back footnote. to the art world, and I wanted to just answering your question about seven days. Yeah, I came back to the art world, and um, I trained as an ethnographer and had a like kind of a sociological. Um, set of spectacles. And so I started looking at the art world from that point of view. And, and that's what led to seven days. So with the um, sociological lens, what does the art world look like? Right now? Well, you know, or then, well, then, I mean, and now. 
I mean, I'm, um, my interests, I like to keep moving and I like to be on the steep part of the learning curve. So right now, I'm really interested in design in a way that I was not at all um, when I was writing Seven Days in the Art World. When I, Seven Days in the Art World is really focused on art and is almost snooty about other cultural forms, you know, and um, I would have made very hard and fast distinctions between an artist and a designer, you know, and um, I mean, partly because there are a lot of artists that have moved into design areas, you could say, or who overlap with design. I mean, someone like Jorge Pardo or Oliver Eliasson, you know, artists I actually really like uh, who, you know, have conceptual underpinnings. There's, uh, you know, a, a lot of design thinking going on in that work. And um, their debate is kind of with the design world almost as much as it is with the art world. And so one of, yeah, one of my 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 hobby interests i don't know or uh, increasingly i'm very interested in design of all kinds graphic design interior design industrial design um and so i think and i'm interested in fashion so i think about the way the art world abuts the design world and the fashion world and things like that and that is that yeah that is not something I thought a lot about when I was doing Seven Days in the Art World. I think because I was like, it seemed like such a big world initially, um, especially in London where I lived at the time and I went to New York a lot and LA in those days because I had family in LA. And um, yeah, so I would say, I, I mean, I think the art world's changed in many ways, but then there are certain parts of the art world that haven't you know it, chapter one of seven days in the art world is called the auction and the kind of structures the structures through which the auction unfolds and the way they create their theater that has not really changed all that much you right. know the prices are different you know what the, the 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 name of the artist that comes at lot 13 has changed you know right. things like that but right. um uh you know chapter two is the crit and that takes place in Michael Asher's post-studio crit class, and Mike, Michael Asher has passed. Yes. You know, and that, I, what, I'm so glad that I was there to document it. He was, at that moment in 2003, four when I was researching the book, I think that class took place in December 2004. Um, uh, he was kind of under the radar. He was really in the shadows. He'd had a moment in the 70s mm -hmm. and, you know, there was, he was like known amongst the cognoscenti. Um, and I just really loved getting to know him, sitting through that crazy class that lasted 15 hours. He's a genius. I mean, he was he, a genius. He, it was amazing. And anyhow, so then it was after that he actually was in the Whitney and won uh, the Bucks Bomb Prize, or I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he kind of had another little moment, mm -hmm. which was awesome, Yeah. Um, before he died. And um, and also, you know, key character in Seven Days in the Art World is John Baldessari. He appears in the Chapter 3, The Fair, set in Basel, Switzerland. And then he shows up again, Oh, and he appears in the crit class, kind of commenting on crits. And he appears in the final chapter in Venice. And he was such a um, such a wonderful mentor. And I have to read a quote from him. This book I read today was translated into 22 languages. That's true. That's amazing. That is great, isn't it? I mean, honestly, it took me five years to write. And so you, I wrote one book and I got 22 books for the price of one, which feels good. <laughs> and it's interesting when you meet people in foreign places who've read it. That is always wonderful. But it's interesting because, I mean, one of the premises of the book in a way is that the art world is very insular. But the fact that it would be of interest to people who speak 22 different languages 
I found really fascinating? Well, it, for me, it's always an indicator that um, the air economy is coming up. <laughs> because, you know, right away, um, it was translated into like the obvious languages like German and Spanish and Italian and French and uh, Japanese. Uh, but, you know, Vietnamese is one of the latest languages to come on board. And, you know, for me, that means they probably got an art fair or something. <laughs> you know, there's like something motivating uh, or, so, you know, there's some kind of critical mass of activity uh, well, happening. I was in Vietnam last spring and I was so impressed. First of all, something like 60 or 70% of that population is under 35. And there is a huge confluence of really smart young people, a lot of whom actually were educated here in the United States That's and then have returned to Vietnam who are committed to making art, selling art, creating these spaces. And I was... I didn't know that Vietnamese was one of the most recent translations of your book, but that makes sense to me, having mm -hmm. just explored the art culture and community there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I found the quote. Fantastic. So he says, um, John Baldessari, this, I'll just read it and then we can talk about it. He says, artists have huge egos, but how that manifests itself changes with the times. I find it tedious when I bump into people who insist on giving me their CV highlights. I've always thought that wearing badges or ribbons or ribbons would solve it. If you're showing at the Whitney Biennial or at the Tate, you could announce it on your jacket. Artists could wear stripes like generals so everyone would know their rank. And it just makes me laugh because, of course, it's so taboo to... You, it's so taboo um, to acknowledge the hierarchies within the art world amongst um, artists in particular. Uh, but, you know, and the thing I like about the art world is that there's so much mixing. So people can start somewhere in life. They could be born into one set of circumstances and then find themselves next to someone who is born into a totally different set of circumstances. And so it is this big mixing pot, but that doesn't mean that there isn't vertiginous hierarchy within that world. Right. Um, anyway, it, for, from a sociological, sociologist point of view, it's particularly wonderful in that regard. You know, the extremes maybe aren't so wonderful, but the fact that you can have, you know, the son of a billionaire sitting next to the son of, or the daughter of someone who, at, who grew up in the projects, and that at that moment, the one who grew up in the projects you know, has got more cultural kudos than the other one. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and I like that you're saying it in that way. One of the things that I loved about running the Aspen Art Museum was, and once we were able to have it be free, was that I felt like it was one of the few places in that community where people could rub shoulders literally with each other, regardless of who they did or didn't vote for, what they did or didn't do on Sunday. Um, and it was this opportunity for people to physically be in the same space with someone they might never otherwise be in that space with and to have a shared experience, which was experiencing a work of art. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's amazing that you made the museum free. It's so important. As someone who lived in London for and traveled Europe, uh, where most of the museums are free, um, I, I find it painful, the price of entry, the high price of entry right. often, um, to get in museums in most American cities. I think museums spend, I, I wish collectors would spend more money making an institution free than, um, contributing to a museum storage costs. You know, <laughs> so I think that it's great, of course, when there's a free day, but it yeah. then 
creates this barrier of entry, right? Where someone has to self-select, they have to do the research, figure out what day it's free or what hour or two hours on which day it's free. And then- It's all an impediment to entry. It is all an impediment to entry because it presupposes that someone has the kind of um, freedom within their schedule that they can come to a museum the one day a week the one hour or two hours a week that it's actually free. Yeah. And people who, to make a gross generalization, but you know, want to or need to come to museums for free often don't have freedom over their schedules. And I think there should be access to art in spaces outside of museums. Agreed. So 100%. Yeah, um, it can be hard uh, to convince people to look at art. I mean, in the city of San exactly. Francisco, there was an, a great program. There have been great programs under different mayors for public art. So there's, I, I was somewhere in the last few days where people kept talking about their superpowers. Oh, yeah. So do you have a superpower? Ooh, I wish I had a superpower. I'm um, sure you have a superpower, but the question I used more to have superpowers. Is, what do you think it is? I used to have superpowers. I mean, when I was younger, I had a near photographic memory. I was very I would um get into an exam and I would flick through the pages of the textbook in my head and then I'd get to the right page and then I'd move down the page and I would zoom in to the spot. So I, I was like a A student, 100%, 98% kind of high school student. And um, so that, and I skipped a couple of grades and went to university at 16. So I would say like something around academics in my youth would would have been my superpower. Unfortunately, you know, sleep deprivation, alcohol, pregnancies and and you know, whatever. Um and now that I'm in my 50s, um I like thinking through problems. I like figuring things out. Um I'm, I'm very good at working solo. I like people and I like to be involved with people, but I'm, you know, I love it when I'm home alone. I work from home and I love being, you know, I love the fact that I live with people, but then I really like to have my time. And um, I've, despite being an academic and working in an advertising agency for a little while as a brand planner, I'm, it's not my calling to have like the a busy job. Mm -hmm. I like a, a kind of slower paced thinking job. And um, so I don't know. I, would you have a superpower? I do have a superpower. Oh, excellent. What is it? So I have I access to my superpower because my YPO forum, which is all women. Yeah which I love, yeah. did an exercise where we each shared three different experiences when we had felt in the flow in our life. Mm -hmm. And only one of them was allowed to be a work one. And so we each described to the group the times that we had been in flow. And then the group listened and then told us each what our superpower was. So the group decided that my superpower is spontaneous brilliance. Yeah, that's nice. I know. <laughs> I love it. Me too. Oh my God. So, oh, that's really, that's like a stable genius kind of situation. Correct. Because <laughs> I can pull it but out whenever I need it. That is so good. Well, um, and so you, but, but is that, that's, what were the other two? Um, three experiences, one superpower. Got, oh, thank God. Okay. So. Three superpowers might be pushing it. <laughs> it would be a lot. I mean, I think that sometimes when I'm writing, I think, ooh, I'm really good at this. <laughs> I, you know, I like, um, hey, I've been writing full time for a long time now. I really understand the mechanics of language. I know how to move words around. Like there's the first draft, which is a certain kind of flow. Then there's the edits. You know, there's no such thing as writing as much as rewriting, but I, it's kind of nice to get things near right first time around. I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a superpower, but, um, I'm a very, 
uh, I'm good at describing things accurately. I'm a, I'm a nonfiction writer through and through. You know, I uh, the, the the superpower of writing fiction is very different. Although creative nonfiction, you know, there's a there's a big overlap there. But sometimes when I'm having a really good day, I feel pretty empowered at my desk. But um, you know. So I don't know if that's objectively discernible from the outside. I think it's just a feeling of flow. <laughs> I think they're both equally legitimate. What would you say you're most proud of? Mm, you know, my, I, my, uh, my kids spring to mind, which is funny because, um, you know, neither of them went to Harvard. And, um, I, you know, neither of them is a chess champion. And a lot of the things that might one, m might, one might normally brag about are not apparent. Um, I, my son is 23 and my daughter's 21. And they're becoming very good people. They're both very smart although very kind of smart in different ways. And, um, and they both have their challenges. Um, yeah. So, th and that might be new for me, I think, because um, they, they've both had setbacks and gap years and those kinds of things. Um, but I, right now I'm feeling very proud of them actually and um, I feel very lucky that they're in my life and I'm and I'm and I'm proud of my partner Jessica Silverman who um, is moving her gallery from uh, one spot to another more fabulous location on Grant Street a six block walk from our home and um, yeah I mean I you know, I will write another book, but um, I am nowhere near being proud about that yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about I'm, I'm thinking about a few things. Um, so your third book is thirty three conversations with artists. Well, it's actually is that the title. Um, it's called Thirty Three Artists in Three Acts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so the first book was Club Cultures, then comes Seven Days in the Art World, and then Thirty Three Artists in Three Acts. So Thirty Three Artists in Three Acts doesn't even have Thirty Three Artists in it, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's got twenty eight. But um, and there is divided into three sections, very anthropological sections. So. Part one is politics, part two is kinship, and part three is craft. And each part has recurring characters who are kind of right. in tension with each other. Right. So act one, politics, the two, the antagonists are Jeff Koons and Ai Weiwei. Right. So they both have many scenes that run, so I've probably interviewed them five or six times and they, and they're not just sit down interviews. They're mostly each of the chapters is written in an observational way. So I'm kind of like following them or watching them. Sometimes it's a conversation, but it's always written up. It's never kind of laid out like a Q and A. And, um, and then there are other artists who are interspersed. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yes, I've never, um, except at artist's request, I've never published Q&As. I tend to, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, I was thinking of like a sharp knife and chopping. <laughs> I tend to cut and splice a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I like contextualizing it and ethnographically. So I would say like the interviews I do are ethnographic interviews insofar as I'm always interested like in what the artist is doing physically with themselves. Like are they walking around and doodling or doodling? Are they painting? Do they make eye contact with me or not? You know, what's on their bulletin board? I'm kind of doing a diagnostic read on them at the same time as listening to them speak. And so that's how I, I, so I write them up kind of in that ethnographic envelope, I guess you could say. 
So I, yeah, I don't, I don't see the book as a series of conversations, although I can see why someone would describe it that way. Since that's what I do. And yeah, that's exactly. My book is. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. No. And I have your book on the shelf yeah. here somewhere. And we have a, we have a, we have an overlap of one or two artists between our two books. Um, my shelf is a little disorganized, so it might take me a while to find it, but I'm pretty sure, um, well, Micheline Thomas, oh wait, no, Micheline's in your book, but she's not in mine. She is. Yeah. She's yeah. in my second one. Uh, I don't know if there, we have, share any artists between the two books. Be interesting to look at. So do you, it's, it's interesting that you're talking about what you're looking for and also, I guess, what you're listening for. Right. So do you do that with everyone? Um, I'm really interested in nonverbal behavior. So if I'm like attentive, I'm usually looking at what they're saying with their body and how that might reinforce or, or, or undermine what they're saying. <laughs> and um, I'm... I'm really interested in the truth and I'm interested in what people say because they think that's what others want to hear versus what they say because they've dug around and they're going to spit it out even if they think it's unpalatable. I'm kind of interested in all the different levels like that. Um, so we have two overlaps, Rashid Johnson and Gabriella Roscoe. Yes. I am also really interested in truth. And I had a conversation with a guy today um, who had written an article for Inc. Magazine. And it was about how when people are nice to you, particularly professionally, they're often wasting your time. <laughs> and his assistant asked me to read the article before we had our conversation. Um, and I mean, I know him. Um, he is a super smart guy and I've been on his podcast and he's written an article about me for Inc. Magazine. But the idea was that if people would just sort of bite the bullet and tell you what they really think, and he was giving the example of salespeople. And if someone says, you know, oh, give me a call or whatever, and then the salesperson continues to follow up and then gets annoyed because the salesperson is sending holiday cards and, you know, has a tickler to keep calling if they had originally said, look, I buy that from my brother-in-law or, you know, I'm not interested. It's actually like this huge waste of time. And then yeah. the other example was, you know, if you, for example, show a marketing report to one of your colleagues and they think that it's a six out of a 10, <laughs> but they don't tell you then, and they tell you that it's great, then they're allowing mediocrity. Mediocrity. Yeah. So I am, um, and uh, to, to, and Kevin Daum is his name, by the way. I mean, one of my problems is I'm far too frank. I don't, do you think that's a problem? Um, a lot of people think it's a problem, but I, I, it's me. And I, um, I think politeness can be cold and, well, I mean, I think I'm a polite person. Don't get me wrong. I'm Canadian, you know, and you know how to be polite. <laughs> and I was brought up very nicely and I know I can do mind my, you know, my peas and thank yous, please and thank yous and that kind of thing. Um, so I believe in politeness, but I also think you can kind of kill someone with cold politeness. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know what you mean. And that um, I'd rather, and I also almost can't help myself nowadays. I, as a writer, you kind of practice telling the truth. And then it's hard to get out of that habit if you're in a different crowd who's not expecting you to behave that way and actually maybe doesn't even know you're a writer, <laughs> you know? And... Um, I, I kind of like knowing people and I like making a connection that cuts through some of the boring bullshit. Actually, one of my, one of my lines often is I, I like emphatic conversation, not phatic conversation. And of course, phatic conversation is like, uh, weirdly, we don't even, only linguists talk about phatic conversation, but it's, 
is all the weather and nice day and, you know. Although I do love talking about people's shoes. <laughs> well, but that's an obsession rather than fat. That's an emphatic conversation for me. <laughs> for sure. So I always tell the truth. And I used to ask people if they really wanted to know what I thought before I said that's what a, I was going to say. That's strategic. That's a, that's a good thing. Well, often it was people asking me about art or artists yeah. uh, or specific artworks. And often it was people who were thinking about acquiring something. Yeah. And, or they would ask me about something they already had yeah. and what I thought of it. And so, you know, people are attached to their decisions, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions, people are invested in the decisions that they make. Oh, and, and, the, so and they can be very hurt. They can be very hurt. People's taste is very, can be very close to them. Exactly. So I used to ask and say, you know, I always tell the truth. And so are you sure that you want me to answer your question? Yes, that's a good, yeah. And that's, I think, a good approach. I think uh, that's an excellent approach. And I should make sure to ask that in future. <laughs> you, you could. But the other thing that I've been working on is always telling the truth or not ever saying anything that's not true, right? And so there's um, a... In that, there's a lot of opportunity, right? Because, and it's not about being nice, and it's not about the idea that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. It's just about being really intentional with the mm -hmm. words that I choose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yeah. No, I think that, um, I, I can be, I, I wish I were intentional all the time. The, I, I, I make mistakes when I'm tired. Everyone does. And, um, and also when I've had too much social interaction. Mm -hmm. So um, Jessica, my partner, has, an amaz has amazing stamina for social interaction. But she's an art dealer. Mm -hmm. And thank God, because she's a middleman, and that's her job. She's got to deal with so many people every day. Just and the number of emails and calls and face-to-face -face encounters she has on a daily basis, I would be a basket case. And um, so I, uh, I need to pace my uh, interaction differently. And, um, well, I mean, that's the cliche, isn't it, between introverts and extroverts? An extrovert is someone who is energized by social interaction, whereas an introvert is someone who is exhausted by social interaction. And I, I, I need social interaction and I really love it and I find it stimulating, but um, I'm, 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 I, you know, I also need breaks. Yeah, <laughs> interestingly, so do I. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not surprised. I mean, I think that um, writers and curators are um, kind of professions, more parallel professions, let's say, than, um, I mean, to be honest, a museum director has got to be like super social. So museum directors are more like dealers. But, but curators are a bit more like the, the art historian or the writer or the whatever, academic. Yeah, so can so, you Well, you've do clearly the both done both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the both and. Yeah. So I want to ask you about an aesthetic experience that you have had with an artwork. And what I mean by that is when has a work of art taken you out of right where you are and transported you somewhere else? Whether it made you cry or didn't, that's not what I'm looking for. But I believe, and I know you do too, that works of art have energy and being in their presence is profoundly affecting um, in a positive way. And I'd love to hear of some time that that has happened for you. You know, I have, I've had, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of those kinds of experiences um, with old art and new art and you know, I, I, I'm kind of flooded with the possibilities of what I could talk about. You know, Velasquez at the 
Prado. Are you going to say Las Meninas? Because that was one no, of mine. No, actually, okay. well, Las Meninas, <laughs> yes, is that room. Yeah. But the painting that really kind of made me cry, Las Meninas has like an amazing wow factor. And it's the, a phenomenal painting and I can stare at it forever. But the one that hit me, like, like punched me is Bacchus, which is just to the left. Yes. Yes. You look at the faces of those drunken Spaniards and they and they look like farmers on the side of the road that you could see today. The, the way Velasquez has this kind of photographic sense of time compared to someone like Leonardo where it's it's kind of like you can see the period it took him to paint it like inscribed on the face of the Mona Lisa or whatever. Velasquez's sense of time is so crisp. It's hard to believe that he made those paintings so many centuries before the camera was invented. And so, yeah, so at one, or, oh my God, another Velasquez painting. This was one of my most amazing art experiences ever um, because I'm also a Francis Bacon fan and you probably know where I'm going, but basically I, I was with the kids in Rome and all of a sudden it started raining and I was like, shit, where am I going to go? And I kind of was, it was pre Google maps and I'm looking through the guide trying to find something local. And it turns out there's some palazzo like round the corner. So we run in there and, um, and we're looking at the private collection and, and, you know, there's an amazing Lita in the Swan by Raphael or whatever. And I'm like, wow, you know, private hands still interesting. <laughs> and then turn a corner and there's a uh, Pope Innocent X. And he was in his own little room and he was so spooky. <laughs> he was so spooky. And the reason that the painting ended up in this family's hands, he was the uncle and the Pope, of course, not surprisingly, didn't like the painting. <laughs> and so it kind of has, this family was related to Pope Innocent X. Uh, I think it's the Pamphili. I'm not sure I can pronounce it correctly. So like in terms of old art, probably, you know, the, uh, or at least in terms of Baroque, you know, yeah. Velasquez is my guy. Yeah. Um, you know, they're... And more recently, with more recent art, um, Jessica and I were in Santa Fe for uh, New Year's a couple of years ago, and we went to the Real Wright Museum. And I um, lived in the UK for a long time, and I feel like I'm catching up on Native American art. You know, I there's not a lot of it in the in Europe mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. In Canada, First Nations art is big. Yes. Um, particularly on the West Coast, but I was kind of cut off from that. And, you know, the real headquarters to it here, like the Denver Art Museum or uh, the Wheelwright in Santa Fe or any of the other museums in Santa Fe, outside of Santa Fe in New Mexico, I hadn't really experienced them. So we went to the Wheelwright and we saw this solo show by an artist called Roseby Simpson. And who... Jessica has since shown, and we have a piece in the house. And I, I don't know, it just kind of like opened up a whole world for me, a whole, a different relationship to the land, a different relationship to gender, a different relationship to kinship. It's not like any of it is obvious in the work, but it's, basically like a, a, a very different tribal community situation is in the atmosphere around the work. So I'm, I'm, you know, although I study, although I'm an ethnographer on the sociological end, I've long been interested in anthropology as a way of looking at culture and, um, yeah, anyway, so I'm rambling. But what is uh, it? so I, yeah, I, I mean, I've had many, many aesthetic experiences. The other thing, most important thing to be said about Rose is um, her primary medium is ceramics. And my mother was a ceramicist, but she basically made pots. So, for example, you know, this is one of her. One of your mom's pots? Yeah. So she did mugs and teapots and pitchers and things like that. Love it. Um, 
And so I grew up with a wheel and a kiln in the house and there, you know, there was always clay around and things like that. So the tribe that Rose comes from, um, historically the women have been ceramicists and the men have been textile workers. Huh. It's a gendered thing. And, and, and her, she's from like 11 generations of artists on her mother's side. So she grew up in her mother's studio. Her mother grew up in her grandmother's studio. Her grandmother grew up in her great grandmother's studio. And, and I, the, that combined with the clay, just like, you Got know. You. Anyway, and she's just amazing in what she can do with clay. I mean, anyway, you know, I have a soft spot for, um, I love Grayson Perry. Um, I love Woody Diothello. I'm, I, I have a soft spot for really great ceramics. I don't like Betty Woodman. I, I'm so sorry if any of your listeners own her work. <laughs> I'm, I really don't like Betty Woodman. But anyway, because I don't feel like it has to be in clay. That's an interesting observation. And I'm, I'm not that keen on the forms. But I don't like Memphis either much. <laughs> so but, uh, what, is it, what does it feel like for you when you get interested in something? Oh, it's so exciting, isn't it? It's so energizing. I feel sorry for people who don't have um, aesthetic interest. And it's weird, like in our apartment building, I serve on the board. And so I'm kind of getting involved with people for whom aesthetics is a total irrelevance. And there's this really nice guy, really smart, older gentleman, worked in the chemical business all his life. So there is a business with like no aesthetic form mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. There's not even packaging. I mean, he was selling chemicals to other businesses. They just arrived in a tank. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know. It's hard to meet people like that, actually. And I think, too, his wife dealt with all the aesthetics in the house, like any decorating. And, you know, I don't know how he chooses what he wears in the morning. But it seems like not to be a thing. Right. Um, and I feel like, wow, I don't think I could get through life like that. Because um, for me, aesthetics and beauty are one of my great joys in life. And when things are really distressing... When politics is horrible and, I, and, and it looks like global warming is going to kill my great-grandchildren if I ever have any. But, you know, uh, all of that, um, I take pleasure in, you know, reorganizing the plants and the small sculptures <laughs> in the living room. Or, um, you know, thinking about how this room could be better curated. <laughs> you know, those are, th and going to a museum and being blown away, um, looking out my window and seeing Grace Cathedral, which is not an entirely successful building, but it's, it, it is done with, um, it's got many moments of uh, visual interest. <laughs> so why do you think art matters? Oh my God, art matters so much. Art, art matters in so many different ways. I would say art matters like in at least 30 different ways. And it depends on the moment. I mean, art can bring people together. I mean, I, one of the reasons why I couldn't imagine not having art in my house is like, what would we talk about? I mean, art is an icebreaker, isn't it? Like it is a, uh, you know, a, a, it can be a bond. Uh, it is a form of self-expression when it's in your home. Um even more complex and interesting self-expression like the, than, you know, the typical outfit. Um, uh, it's artists are doing important research through their art into everything. I tend to be very interested in the body right now. And I think one of the reasons why artists on the rise internationally one of the reasons contemporary art um uh it, you know a lot of museums are getting more footfall and contemporary art is getting a lot more attention in many parts of the world i think one of the reasons for that is because we experience so much culture through our screens music and books and in in tv and video and even theater <laughs> is experienced through these small screens and um 
you know, despite Instagram, you still really need to experience things in the flesh. And so the scale and texture of art, um, even the scale, even the texture of a photograph when it's printed and put inside a frame um, honors our bodies and the neurons in our stomach. You know, apparently we have more neurons in our stomach than a cat has in its brain. And I, 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 I'm in, you know, I do yoga, I swim. I, 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 I believe it, that we, there's intelligence all over us. It's not all like above the neck. Art is incredibly important. I just, I, and, and it, it would be hard to list the many ways. It depends on the time of day, you know? <laughs> I love, I love the challenge of art mattering for 30 at least 30 different reasons. And I think I'm going to work on that. Good. Because also, you know, I get irritated when people talk about the right reasons. Right. I do. You know right. what? There's a lot of different reasons. Nobody's interested in art for one reason. I mean, okay, we can say it makes our lives more meaningful. And in a world without God, we really need art. And even with the world with God, maybe we need art to express it. The, to express the divine. And that's been historically a place that art has occupied. Oh my God. I love that we're at the end of our conversation and you just squeezed in there um, within the last four minutes, beauty, God, and the divine. That's why I wanted to talk to you today. Thanks for inviting me over. Thank you so much, Heidi. I appreciate it. Thanks. Conversations About Art is part of HiZ.Art. Simon Illa is our producer. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Jordan Weisberg is our curatorial associate. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We will be back again every other Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>